be very, very quiet. I'm hunting wabbits. <laughs> hey, everybody. Dennis Gebhardt here. Welcome to this episode of Rabbit Trails with myself and my good friend, Max Masano. We are excited about today because uh, we've added some extra segments to our program. One new segment that I'm very excited about is uh, the, the nice name or the gentle name of it is called Lost in Translation. And what we call it around here is say what? Uh, you know, you've heard me talk many, many times about the plethora of information that's out there on social media. And the fact that there's a lot of information, but there's a lot of misinformation as well. And I know some of you watch this and you kind of go, ah, yeah, you blow me off. You kind of say, yeah, maybe, maybe not. So here's what we've decided to do here at Rabbit Trails. We've decided to watch social media and to see where some of this information is coming from and then to bring it to you and give you our opinion about maybe some of the missing pieces that weren't given to you in that educational event. And here's the reason that I do this. Number one, it's not to contradict your belief system. It's not to be condescending. We're doing this because we wanna provoke your thought process. See, to me, I encourage everyone to ask questions. If it doesn't make sense to you, ask questions so you get clarity. For some of us, we don't ask those questions. We get just enough information sometimes to simply confuse us. And so what we want to do is to help you decipher that information and get more clarity, which is gonna make you more successful and empower you. And of course, one of the missions of Guru Nation is to help you discover your own personal genius. Now, if you're an educator and you're watching this episode, I wanna just really tell you that being an educator is great, feels really good but it takes a lot of responsibility too. We have to be accountable for the information that we share. Well, I'm not saying that you need to share my information or Max's information, but share the right information. Many of you have heard me speak before and I always say, never believe anything I tell you, always test it so that you own that information. And then it no longer comes from here. You're not reciting something. It comes from here because you're feeling something in your heart. And that's where passion, that's where that consistent delivery comes from. And that's where you connect with all of the learners that are in your class. You know, experts say that at the get-go, we lose 20% of our audience automatically because of personality, because of vocal uh, modulation, because of all types of things have nothing to do necessarily with content. Content's part of it. But there's a myriad of reasons why we lose that percentage of people. But if we strive to give more value than they pay for the education, <clears throat> then we find a lot of times we end up really connecting with the people, almost the entire group. So um, you, we normally drink coffee in this program, but today I bought a little Cuervo and I'll just say to you, buckle up, buttercup, this is going to be a bumpy ride. So, Max, how are you, buddy? Good morning. Good morning. I'm doing great, Dennis. Thanks for having me here today. Great, great. So, look, why don't you just let everybody know how you're feeling about what we're going to do today? Because we're, you know, we're walking on, you know, on that little, that icy part, that slippery slope. And we want them to really not, not look at it that way. We want them to really take the information we share to heart and see how those missing pieces that we learn from, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes we don't get them in the education. Yeah, well, I think that you really summed it up perfectly. You know, first and foremost, to be an educator takes a lot of guts to put yourself up in front of people and put yourself out there. And, you know, we give props to anyone who wants to do that. By the same token, really owning the information and being able to deliver it in a clear, concise manner so that all learning types can understand it and take it back and apply is really key. You know, some educators are better than that than others. So all we're trying to do is take some of these things that we've heard from our students in our classes that have picked up 
right. you know, from out in the ether and actually bring a little more clarity to it. So exactly. it's not that what uh, anyone says is wrong. Right. We just want to kind of complete that thought so that it's more understandable. I think that was profound. Uh, yeah. Exactly. We're not saying that anyone is wrong. What we're saying is that there's some missing parts that would have been easier for someone to absorb that information. Yeah. And we've all been there, you know, at some point in oh. our education career, you yes. know, so. You know, I think one of the most revealing times for me when I was training to be an educator was I had the opportunity to attend a program called format for learning. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I had gone to trainer education before we, you know, quantum teaching, all of those different books and with Blair Singer and all of those people who really promote that kind of uh, training. <clears throat> but until I had the opportunity to work with those folks at format for learning, um, it really opened my eyes and it helped me understand how important it is. Uh, and, and you've heard me say this, you know, uh, here's what they know. It's like if I present information to people that have no background or no foundation and it's foreign information to them, their ability to keep up is really difficult. Yeah. But that's why it's important when you initially set up your programs that you build a foundation. You build something so that everybody can fall back on that and they can use it as a reference point. And, and I think it, it's really helped me be more successful at training and facilitation of information. And I know you had also the great opportunity to yeah. attend that same education. And, yeah. you know, and we've discussed this one-on-one -on -one, that it made a huge difference in the way we approach when we're uh, doing training programs. And so. for our listeners out there, you're going to see a little bit of this magic today as we uh, break down the the what, why, how, and what if of That's right. some of these concepts. Absolutely. All right. So look, we're going to play um, a soundbite, and we're going to play about 90 seconds of the soundbite. Uh, oh, by the way, we have altered the voice, so, so you you won't you won't be able to recognize this person's voice. We've altered the voice. And then we're going to give you about 90 seconds of that information. You'll be able to listen to it. And then we're going to come back in and kind of fill in the blank spots, uh, fill in the spots that we feel would have given more foundation in that segment. Everybody good with that? All right, Max, are you ready? I'm buckled in. Let's All right. Go. <laughs> so I'm going to go to share screen. I'm just going to share the sound. So Perfect. everything's looking good. Mm -hmm. We'll go back here. Oh, yeah. By the way, there's a little intro music that I put on the front end of this. So you guys will have to listen to my crazy music. It won't be that long, though, I promise. Here we go. about an N in general, it's going to be warm because there's two warms to one cool always. There are different ratios in every color line. It's a good idea to find out what your color line the base is. Um, and that's a kind of a good starting point to understand that. Your secondary colors, they are made from combining two primary tones. Okay, so the secondary colors are purple, green, and orange. And when you think about these tones, you want to always think that now you are dealing with two tones in every color instead of just one. So in terms of glossing or knocking stuff out, you have to use two colors to knock out two colors, right? The tertiary colors, they are made by mixing one primary and one secondary. So now when you get into tertiary colors, you're combining even more than just two tones. Now when you think about this when coloring hair, every time you are lifting someone or bringing them back down, you're always dealing with primary tones and secondary tones and tertiary. All right, that was our little alien sound that we're at the end of the first 90 second sound bite. I need to wake back up. <laughs> so Max, 
would you uh, would you like to share a little bit of information about what you saw happen in that first segment? And um, let me preface it by saying, this is teaching the color wheel. Okay, this is the beginning. This is the foundation. Yeah. Well, number one, there was a lot there, but uh, the uh, uh. the the first thing that came to mind, um, which is related to the color wheel, but uh, it's its own ball of wax, was the what she had said about all N series are was it two warms yeah. in one pool. Yes, and I mean, all, yeah, all of them are warm because there's two warms to one cool. Yeah. I think what they were trying to give you the idea is, is that it's equal parts of blue, red, and yellow. Right. And I think that um, the first thing that we should all just pump our brakes with is, especially in this industry, there are no absolutes, you know? Amen. Every, you know, every color lines N series is going to be different. Some color lines, the N stands for neutral. Some mm -hmm. color lines, the N stands for natural. And there is definitely a difference between those. You know, the word neutral actually means, if you look up the derivation, without color. Yes. So it's not warm and it's so, not cool so i'm going to use a color without color to color the hair is that what right. i'm saying right <laughs> i, yeah. I love that <laughs> and then i think some hair color lines translate it to it's a you know color without tone yes so yeah. you know it's a brown or a blonde with no predominant reflect right yeah you know and then a new, uh, that could be a neutral and then a natural could actually replicate warmth. Yeah. Yes. You know, Absolutely. and it all kind of depends, you know, it, we, we've been saying this since the day, you know, it goes back to learning what's under the hood of your color line and going back and, you know, just doing a few die outs. And I mean, Dennis, I learned that from you. Well, thank you for that. And you're, you're absolutely right. It's like, it's great to say you need to learn the base of your brand. Yeah. But then, okay, so I'm sitting there going, uh, how do I do that? Right. Will you tell me how to do it? What do I do? Right. And so you have to take it that extra step. Here's what I see. This is, this is the beginning. Okay. You get baby hair colorists in your class. They're babies. Right. And you say that all neutrals, all N series are warm. You shouldn't even be talking about that there because they're starting in with the color wheel. Right. You know, th there's other things that need to be focused upon, like primary, secondaries, and tertiaries, or the why. Why, why is the color wheel important for us to understand? You know, because here's the thing, that color wheel has nothing to do with hair color, nothing. And yet we use it as a tool so we can understand how colors works together. Some people use it and teach an art class to people who color hair. And I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna ruffle some feathers. Coloring hair is not like painting on a canvas in art class. Coloring hair is not like painting a wall. It's not like painting a post. When we color hair, we take a chemical solution, hair color, and we alter both physically and chemically the structure of another chemical structure called hair, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and sulfur. We are in the chemistry business. Hair color helps give us some clarity. It's a great tool to use. But as Max, as you said, it's, there's no absolutes. And that's why I say hair color is the science of precise estimation. And because of that, that is why you get so many varying opinions about, about the education. Because there's no qualification. 
there's no requirement of scientific substantiation. So it's all presumption in a lot of cases. You know, there's certain parts that are science and you can't defy that. Right. So think about this as the first class you attended. I mean, first of all, you know, if my instructor is not excited about the color wheel, <laughs> it's, it's a precursor of what I'm in store for for the rest of the day. You might be in for a bumpy ride. That's right. So, um, and here's another thing that, that in this little 90 minutes, 90 second segment that I think you have to, to listen to. Think about someone who doesn't know much about color. And they say when you have two colors and you mix them together, two primaries, you create secondary. So now you don't have one tone, you have two. That's absolutely not true. When I take primary colors and we're talking about art, we're talking about paint, we're talking about anything. When I mix two colors together, I have a different color. It's not two tones, yeah. it's one tone. You have a new color that was created from mixing two yes. other colors. Exactly. It's its own animal. Exactly. And then you go to tertiary colors. You don't have three tones in a tertiary color. You have one tone. It's made of two parts of one color and one part of another, right. but it's still one color. So you have to keep that in mind because sometimes, you mean I have to use two tones to neutralize the other tone? Let's un that makes everything convoluted. Just talk about the color wheel, the color straight across. You can break them down later, okay? I mean, to, it, to just add to that too, please. it's like, um, what you're really looking for when you are correcting these secondary tones that you see in the hair, right? you are looking for the missing primary. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, you know, has been taught since time immemorial. But when you really have a thorough understanding of the color wheel, you know, then it really makes sense, you know? Exactly. It's like really learning what you're looking at as opposed to, you know, just taking a stab. Right. And understand that in every tube of color, it's not going to always finish the same right. based upon how the chemist built the color. Right. Some color brands don't simply have brown. They have brown plus another tone. So, so you have to figure that out. How do you know the base of your color? Here's how you do it. You dye out your colors. And get, your, get a t-shirt, a bed sheet, I don't care. Mix up your level six shades with 20 volume, paint them and leave them alone. Yeah. Come back and check them the next day. And what will happen is it will reveal the background that's in your color. That's what a lot of people call base actually base in the world of chemistry. If you're talking to a color chemist and you say, what's your base? They may say monolethanolamine. No, no, the base. Monolethanolamine, aminomethylpropanol. No, because <laughs> they think of base as the alkaline part of the color. Okay, so dye it out. You'll see what the background in your color is. You'll see if there's any additional tone around the edges. That's what you're coloring here with. And just because a manufacturer tells you one thing doesn't necessarily mean it is across the board, which is Amen. why dying out a whole series is, you know, kind of key because some of the deeper shades might have a totally different base than the lighter shades. Absolutely. You know, depending on the color line you're working with the corrective right. base could be built into each of the N series shades. Exactly. You know, so it's not just blue or blue violet or this or that seeing is believing. And that's the thing, you know, even, even for myself, you know, the other day I use, I have a plethora of hair color 
in the salon. Mm -hmm. And I have stuff that I know works and I have my go-to formulas just like everybody else. Right. And the other day, you know, I was like, you know, I did this highlight and I was like, all right, I just want to, I want to gloss this and just knock out a tiny bit of this warmth and shine it up and do this. And I grabbed, I grabbed my go-to color. I used it. And as I was like applying it and, you know, processing, I went, I've never actually swatched this out. I don't actually know <laughs> what it is that I'm putting on the hair. I went, I know it works and that's, and that's great. But like, you know, I ended up taking a little bit of that color there that was go. left in the bowl. I took yeah. a, I like to use the wax strips, the white Yeah, you wax can use strips. the wax strips in the and salon. Yeah. I just, I just painted it on and, you know, stuck it to the side. Right. And then the next day I actually saw what I was working yeah. with. So it's, it really doesn't cost you as a stylist or an owner much like to swatch out, even if you're just doing it while you work, but it is such an eye opening experience. Right. Right. Now, can all of you see if you're taking notes, if you decided, Hey, this is good info. And I'm going to write this down. Can you see how much was missed from that first 90 seconds? You know, the experts on relationships say that two human beings coming together for the first time evaluate the quality of the relationship they think they're going to have within the first 10 seconds. So you just saw 90 seconds. Can you imagine there are already people that are probably checked out of this class because of a myriad of different things in addition to the fact that the content is not, it's not accurate. It's not complete. It's not complete. So you ready for our second one, Max? Yeah. All right. Here I mean. we go. So in terms of glossing, you're gonna to wanna to think about what am I really trying to knock out in this color? Or what am I trying to avoid when you're lifting? Even just one level. I mean, you're exposing underlying pigments no matter what. This next part, it gets a little confusing, so I'm, I'm gonna look at my notes um, a bit, but the name of a color is actually a, a hue. It's called a hue. And the hue, the saturation of, the saturation of a hue is the intensity or purity of it. So high saturation is bright and desaturation is washed out. So high saturation would be your warmer colors and desaturation would be your cooler colors. Okay, the value is the degree of lightness or darkness of a hue, which that's going to give you your shade, that is produced by adding black or white. So a lot of times you will hear people adding black to their formulas and you're like, why are they doing that? <laughs> like, what does that even do? You are changing the value of the hue. So I use 1B a lot in my glasses. Just a drop in what you're doing. Say what? Didn't they do this in Wayne's world? Yeah. <laughs> like. All right. Okay. So, may I uh, may I jump in on this? Please. Okay, so here's the problem. There are certain pieces in that segment that are true. But there's so much convolution that no one has clarity from that. So if I were to present this, here's what I would say. The color wheel has three properties that affect that color wheel. These three properties are, first of all, one is called hue. A color is not, the name of the color is not hue. <laughs> hue is the name of the color. So that was said backwards. So hue is what we call the name of the color, blue, red, violet, green, orange, yellow, whatever. Okay, now, they jumped right from hue 
into partial information on something called chroma. So here's the thing about hue. Hue is a horizontal measurement. So as you go around the wheel, there's 360 degrees. So basically there's 360 potential hues. We learned 12. Value, which this person talked about, is a measurement of dark to light. That's a center of the wheel measurement from dark to light. And then from the center to the outside ring of the wheel, there's another property called chroma, C-H-R-O-M-A. Chroma is a measurement of purity, not hue. Value is a measure of saturation, not hue. So when you say the brighter the color, the higher the saturation, the pure, purer the color is really the word, the descriptor, brighter, think about how the learner thinks, brighter means lighter to them, it does not necessarily mean more pure in tone. And then the closer to the outside of the wheel, the tone is more pure. Closer to the inside of the wheel, the tone is more flat, muted, or drab. It's more subdued. Cool colors are not desaturated colors. That was also said there. Every color, cool or warm, can have a pure portion of it and it can have a desaturated portion of it, but that's a measure of chroma, right. intensity of color. Now, depth. It is true in art, if you add black to something, a small portion of black, you can add depth. It is true in art, true in art, not hair coloring, if you add black to something, you can have more depth. There is no white in hair color. Remember, black and white are anomalies. They are achromatic, meaning no tone, achromatic anomalies. So if I want to make a color darker in the hair color world, I have to add a color that's going to absorb more light versus a color that will reflect more light. So I can make a color look darker without using black. I could use violet. I could use green because green's one part blue. I could use blue. I could use gray. See, there's a lot of choices because you're taking a color that absorbs more light than a color that adds more, that reflects more light. So if I wanted to add brightness to my shade, all I have to do, I wouldn't add white to it. I'd add yellow. Because yellow is the maximum amount of reflection that you get. There's nothing beyond yellow. Right. Clear doesn't give you reflect. <laughs> clear is zero. There's nothing in clear. It's the base of hair color. So imagine that first segment, that, that second 90 seconds, totally convoluted the story. I'm sure the desire was to make it clear because they said, let me read. That means they don't own the information. Whenever I have someone in front of me and they're reading from a page, that means they don't own that information. It's not coming from a place of ownership. It's coming from a place of reciting what they just learned in another educational event. Whoa. Can you see my passion there, Max? Yes, definitely. Um, I have actually an awesome quote from Mr. Munsell uh, as he describes his color sphere, and I'd like to read it. Please do. He says, let us substitute a geometric solid like a sphere and make use of geographical terms. So everybody picture a globe. All right. Yep. The North Pole is white. The South Pole is black. Yep. The equator is a circuit of middle reds, yellows, and other hues. Above the equator are lighter values. Below the equator are darker values. So that kind of sums it up. Amen. 
Amen. And we will show a picture Amen. of the color sphere. So yes. you can kind of get it. And if you think about it, you can apply this to a hair color line. You know, the center of your sphere series, mm -hmm. the outermost ring, you have your the most purity of the hues. Those could be your intensifier. The right. closer you get to the center of the circle or are your more, you know, like red browns, ash browns, golden browns, right. you know, the lighter are your blondes. And again, you know, swatching out your hair color line really shows you where everything would live in this sort of three-dimensional construct that is, you know, the color sphere. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And, um, yeah. you know, that's the way I learned color. I learned it as a sphere, not as uh, the Grumbacher color wheel. Because <laughs> the Grumbacher color wheel is like exactly as Max said. It's like you took a slice out of the middle. And that's all that it, it's a slice. That's why you only learn 12 colors. Because <laughs> right. it's just a slice. So, so hopefully you're gleaning out of this information that we're sharing with you that there are a lot of missing pieces that would help someone if they really wanted to have a solid foundation and be able to actually master color. And I have a, yeah. I have a big issue with mastery because I believe you're still learning. So you might be kind of a master, but you're like a learning master or you're a student master. Okay, because you never, until you stop learning. And then when you stop learning, usually you're not here. You go to the big salon in the beauty, you know, the big salon in the sky. And uh, then you can call yourself, they can call you a master if you earn that title. Yeah. Okay. But I think too, though, even even the the best student master, you still got to have your Yoda. You Amen. Know? If you stop having a Yoda or you think you've arrived, that might be time to, to pack it up because yeah, you start you believing know. your own press. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. I, one of my mentors always said to me, listen, there's always going to be someone who's been doing it longer than you and better than you. Mm -hmm. So, right. you know, stay on your right. game. Yeah. And if you're an educator and you're watching this, I say, don't believe your own press. You know, some of us get all excited because we have, you know, 180,000 followers. And we go, woo, I'm really powerful. <clears throat> Look, stupidity knows no boundaries. It doesn't matter how long you've been doing hair. It doesn't matter how many followers you have. What matters is, are you watching yourself? Are you trying to be a better person than you were the day before? Are you trying to master your craft every day? If you're doing that, I think you're doing a good job. All right, so let's go on to the final piece here. Is your, you're changing that degree of lightness or darkness, okay? And then in terms of adding white would be if you're adding clear to something. So that's our white. If you were a painter, how many of you guys, are you, any of you paint? Okay, let's be clear just for a minute. You have no white in hair color, I'm sorry. Okay, so clear and white, white and clear are two different things. Clear has nothing. You know, white is an achromatic anomaly. It has, it will have a fact, but clear is nothing. Yeah, okay, so that would be similar when you're making your colors to paint, you're adding white or black, and you can make any shade with any primary color from adding white or black. Okay, I'm sorry, Max, I got to stop this in the middle. Yep. yep. You can make any shade from any primary color by adding white or black. Wrong. Simply wrong. You can't add white to the color because there is no white in hair color. And by adding black, you can make a color deeper. You can, you know, um, the drop. How many of you on social media have seen the drop? It was created in 19, actually 1988, 1989. The drop was originally created to be Shade GQ users. 
was originally created to be 1 16th of an ounce of 01B. And Shady Q, that's the blackest color they've got. To two ounces of their clear. Their clear is simply the hair color <clears throat> without any pigment in it. And they would mix it with two ounces of processing solution. That's what the drop was originally designed to be. It was supposed to stay on the head for 20 minutes. It has morphed here into 2021 to where you add, I think it's a drop of the black to two ounces of, um, to two ounces of clear, two ounces of processing solution, and you leave it on the head for like 45 seconds, right? Okay, so there's not even time for the dyes to oxidize. So <clears throat> those kinds of things happen. So you cannot, I mean, black does help you in some cases. Here's why. The only reason people use black in a diluted form is because of the pigment concentration in a black shade. It has the maximum pigment concentration of any of the other colors made. So the pigments there are much stronger, are much more pure. So I want to use that because sometimes if I dilute it, that pigment is not going to look softer. It's still going to be strong. It's just going to be at a diluted level. And sometimes I need those stronger pigments at lighter levels to control the warmth that hair contributes. You also heard this person talk about underlying pigment. I hate that word because it tells you that something is lying underneath something else. And it's not, uh, as one of my friends said, when he thought he was poking the bear, provoking people, he said undertones don't exist. And they don't. When I lighten hair, I change the structure. I break the structure of the hair down into smaller pieces. As I break it down into smaller pieces, I increase reflection. I diminish light absorption. That's what we call lift in hair color. That's what we call undertone, underlying pigment, or remaining pigment contribution. Anything you want to say, Max? I'm sorry, I had to stop it because I... No, um, I was just going to say, you know, we actually, what was it, a few weeks ago or a month ago, we swatched out the original drop formula on yes. some bleached hair. And it was basically about a level lighter than a, wasn't it a Shades EQ 9T? Yes. You know, so, and now they actually have it a level 10T. Of course. To do it for you. You know, but it was it was just a very uh, ashy, ashy, bluish gray, right? You know, toner, basically. Yeah. yeah. And well, and again to what you said about underlying pigment, because I I know the the bear poker you're talking about. You know, <laughs> in in one of his books, you know, it, it's pretty profound. He says, you know, underlying pigment doesn't exist. But what we create, you know, with right. lightener or color on top of a virgin or previously colored hair, right? you know, is what we're dealing with. That's the 50% yep. of the formula, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, it, it, and again, it's, there are no absolutes, you know, based on someone's, right. you know, the amount of the eumelanin and pheomelanin they have in their hair their eye color is going to be indicative of right. how they're going to lift you know when you lift someone to a level eight not all level eights are created equally amen you know so again yeah you're absolutely all right here we go all right okay warm colors are obviously opposite of cool tones yeah, and then that complementary was complementary colors. When you look at two complementary colors, so let's take red and green. They make each other stand out when they're right next to each other. But when you put them together, they mute each other. With hair color, blue and red are impossible to mute or get rid of. Okay, blue is a very dominant pigment. Red is an extremely dominant pigment. Okay, mm. 
<laughs> okay, so yes, complementary colors do stand out when you lay them side by side. That's why they're called complementary color. One enhances the other. <laughs> Profound. Christmas Easter Broncos. <laughs> yes. Uh, blue and red are hard to mute. I totally disagree. I, blue is a dominant tone. It's going to make the color look deeper or darker. Whatever you mix it with, it's going to make your result look deeper or darker. Red is going to do completely the opposite because red is actually a warm shade and it's going to reflect. So I don't even know where they were going with that piece of information. Do you, Max? No, it's 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 hard to say. It's was the the problem with the statement isn't that it's like was like right or wrong. It's too general. Right. You know what I mean? It's like if you color the hair to a level five red and I take a four gold and put it over top of it, it's probably gonna cover it up. Yeah. Because I'm going you deeper. Because you're changing the color. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think I you know, maybe she was referring, you know, it's like more difficult at the same level. But well, see again, again missing pieces, yeah. But I, I can see where, like, as you know, like if I was a baby hairdresser and someone said, you know, red is impossible to mute out, if I saw red hair, I'd be like, Oh, well, what am I gonna do? You yeah. know, I'm gonna give up. I'm walking yeah. away from this one. Yeah. Yeah. Sad. All right, here we go. So anytime you are trying to deal with those two tones, you want to lift past that. And the cool thing about this is if you count if you count the colored wheel, it's actually the levels of hair color. So blue is one, wow. two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten are right in here. Okay, so automatically you know what undertones are coming out. All right, so that was partially accurate. Um, yes, if you start at blue on your color wheel, the Grunbacher color wheel, and you count blue being number one, you should have some idea of what the hair is going to contribute as it lightens. But it's not, it's not fail safe because that underlying pigment, undertones, remaining pigment contribution, level of reflect, whatever you call it, is not finite. Everybody's hair is not the same. If I took somebody that had the same color of hair I have and we lightened both of our heads, probably we would lighten differently if there were, there's some variation. So remember that that underlying pigment undertone, remaining pigment contribution or level of reflect chart that you see, did I cover them all? <laughs> yeah. That you see is only an estimation of what the hair should be contributing at a specific level. It's not a guarantee because as Max mentioned earlier, there's a couple of people, a couple of guys, not people, couple of guys that you got to think about and it's a guy called you melanin and a guy called feel melanin and if you don't know anything about them you need to get to a class where they talk about that because that will change the way you formulate hair color max um again there are no absolutes so the <laughs> the uh undertone chart or whatever you want to call it is a guide. It's definitely helpful, um, right. but it is, you know, I mean, we've all had it happen to us where something either didn't lift as high as we thought it, you know, it was going to, or, you know, the tone still dominated the color formula. And, you know, that's kind of like a, it's a fact of life. And again, knowing what your color line can do and knowing, you know, how strong, you know, your uh, 
correcting shades are gives you a little bit more insight as far as, you know, dealing with these situations as they arise. Right. You know, and, and it's, it's kind of funny just for me personally, as an educator, the more that we go <laughs> through this, which is, you know, off the cuff, non, non rehearsed, the, the more I keep going back to that same sort of idea. It's like, you know, everyone needs to learn what, what their color line can and can't do. And, and that's yes. gonna, that's going to be the biggest thing. I mean, right. and I wish you would just real quick share that story about the training you did where the ash series wasn't ash. Oh, um, I did a training. I had the opportunity to work with a group of educators for a major manufacturer and we did die outs. The same thing Max has advised you to do and the same thing I've advised you to do. And the discovery was that the ash family had the same background as the natural family. And so the, the lament from the educators was, well, no wonder we can't control more. And they were all upset. They were going to call the manufacturer and say, hey, we got to do something about this. And I go, whoa, 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 whoa. First of all, understand this. Manufacturers probably not going to do anything about this because this line has been out there for a long time. It already has an established following, an established client base. So um, they may try to do something gradually. My experience in 30 years working with manufacturers is they're going to probably try and ignore it. They'll wait to see how many people are actually going to notice it and really object. So as an educator, it's important for you to understand that you have credibility because you're the face of the company now. So if you are have them in a hands-on class and they're using a family of colors that you know full well, don't have as much control in them as you would like them to, to expect. Your swatch book, of course, is made of plastic, so it doesn't match what the hair is really doing then you need to come to a place where you're comfortable in the way you explain how to work with it. So I suggested to them to explain that sometimes the hair contributes a lot of strong warmth. So for me as a colorist, when I'm working with this brand of color, I always add in some extra concentrates and uh, concentrates or enhancements or whatever you call your pure, pure additives you can add to your color formulation. I add those in to help them understand that adding in a little bit of that is going to give them that extra amount of control and it will minimize the amount of people that actually become unhappy with the product because you've given them already an alternative and didn't say, didn't have to say, well, the ass series doesn't control warmth. Right. That was a long way of explaining what happened, but that's what I did for them. And you know, that brand is still out there. Those Ash families are still the same, <laughs> but they just teach it differently <clears throat> so that they understand. But someone's going to do die outs and they're going to go, well, how come they're both the same? This one's supposed to be Ash. Right. I mean, when you do die outs, you discover my reds aren't really red. My golds aren't really gold. And it's I mean, not to say that the manufacturer did a bad job. It's to say, now you know how to work with your color. You know, that's why we want you to do this. Not because we want you to see where there was misformulation. Forget about that. We, we want, want you to, to know what you're working with. Empower you. I mean, yes. how, many, how many times, at, like, have you heard as an educator and for those of you guys watching have felt like you start a new job at a salon and you don't know that color line. Oh yeah. You know, and there is nothing worse than that helpless <laughs> feeling and that awful pit in your stomach. You bet. When you do that first client and you're like, I hope this turns out, you know, <laughs> whereas you literally can save yourself some heartache by swatching out just a few key shades, you know, you don't have to necessarily swatch out the whole line, but right. you know, you know, like, like you said, start at six, 
You bet. Even if you do your fours, your sixes, and your eights, it's going to give you a pretty good indication of what you're working with. And, right. you know, is your gold a yellow gold? Is it a yellow orange gold? You know, things like these things matter at the end of the day because yeah. it's going to give you more of a predictable end result. And that's, you know, again, it's like, Absolutely. you know, back when I was a baby colorist, if something didn't turn out the way I wanted to, I'd say these three words, it didn't work. That's and right. it was the color's fault. It was never my fault. That's right. You we know? are good at that. We are masters at laying blame, denying, and justifying. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Laying blame. Well, I did it the way you told me to do it. So it's not my fault. It's yours. Or the color didn't work. Right. Denial. Now, I don't see it. This is what I'm looking at. I actually, it looks really good. You know, you're crazy. Right. Or justification. Are you on medication? <laughs> well, yeah, I take aspirin. Uh, that's why it fell out of your hair because you're on medication. <laughs> you, you don't see red. It's just a little warm. That's right. Yeah, you that's, don't see that's red. Gold. <laughs> you just see some, some tan. Absolutely. So. Look, um, let's just kind of recap real quickly. Um, hopefully what you've seen in the episode today and in this segment is that not all educational programs are the same. That should be important to you. Um, you've also seen where in our industry, there's so much contradiction about what's actually happening. And a lot of it is presumption. It's presumption, it's, you know, it's estimation, yeah. you know, it's opinion, you know, not a lot of it is really based in science. And you don't have to be a nerd to understand hair color, but it's important to understand what you're working with and understand how it works. You know, one of the greatest gifts my mentor ever gave to me was this statement. He said, if you want to master hair color, learn how hair color works. And I did. I followed what he told me to do. And by understanding how hair color works, it changes the way you feel. It changes the way um, you think. And so today was just less of four minutes of a one hour educational event. And I think we will come back and maybe in our next episode, we'll pick out a few more points about the education to kind of give you an idea about, you know, how we would suggest that you think about this. And hopefully you found this beneficial. Um, remember, our desire is to help you. This is not about us. It's about helping you become a better colorist and feel more confident. Uh, one of the things that happens, I know, is that if we take knowledge that we gain and we apply it and it works, it makes us confident and confidence is what enables us to build a huge, huge clientele. And you should be able to do that. And today, in this day and age, you should be able to do that because we have a lot of people in our industry that are hungry for the why. Why does color work the way that it does? So look, we appreciate you watching us here on YouTube. We invite you to subscribe. You can subscribe right here below the screen. Uh, we do this uh, program on a weekly basis. So like every week, we put a program up, a little episode. We choose a subject. Uh, if you have an idea for some subjects that we you might like us to, to cover or that kind of information, send us a message. Uh, you can contact us on Instagram. You can find Max at Max M Hair on Instagram. You can find me at Real Captain Color. Uh, so we invite you to send us notes. If you enjoy the program, would you let us know as well? If we can do some things to make the program better, please let us know. Uh, we are so excited about the response that we have gotten from this program. Um, we've grown our following here on YouTube. And that's, that's huge for us because our goal is to have a program that is successful and it's beneficial to our fellow salon professionals. Uh, I also invite you to what, go to our website, 
which is www.gurunation.net. And um, on our website, you can um, go to our educational tab. You can find a listing of all the different programs that we offer both online and uh, we have pre-recorded webinars that you can download. Uh, we also have some live events. Hopefully this year we'll be able to do some of those. I'm not sure, but they're at least on the calendar. You can go to our gallery section and you can take a look at some of our education that we do on location, some of the classes that we've done in the past. There's some videos there, which are videos from uh, Brain Smoke, which is a small little uh, program that I do. Most of the time you found that on IG, you find it here on YouTube as well. And Brain Smoke is kind of my personal ranting moment. So <laughs> if you're sensitive, you may not want to listen to me rant. Um, and then we offer a Nuggets program on IG as well, which is like little tidbits of information that you kind of drop along the way so that it kind of helps you. Maybe it helps you get over a situation that you, that you were in. So you can see those as well on our website. So please visit us there. If you found this beneficial, please let your friends know. Um, we, we love to, be, to give you information that's gonna benefit you and uh, stay in touch with us. And uh, I think, is there anything I missed, Max? Uh, I, think you, I think you covered it all. We hope to see everybody in a class sometime in the not so distant future. And, Absolutely. You know, please drop some love in the comments. You bet. And, uh, you know, again, we just want to thank everyone. We're so happy that you're tuning in and hearing what we have to say. You bet. So listen, thank you, everybody. And as always, from my heart to yours, I'm Captain Color. I'm out. Max, how Bye about guys. you? I'm out. All Bye, right. Dennis. See you all. Take care. Bye-bye.